behalf of the Rafua Health Center, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome the esteemed panelists to our presentation tonight. Physicians at Mount Sinai Medical Center, once again, giving of their subject matter expertise to help us as we navigate this very difficult time. Without further ado, I'd like to ask Dr. Jeffrey Vander to get right into this and thank you all for joining. And I'd like to uh, Dr. Rich, the president of Mount Sinai, who helped introduce us last time in leading our efforts, just say a, a few words if you're on. I am. I know, uh, can you hear me, Jeffrey? Sure. Very good. Thank you, everyone. I, I wanted to uh, welcome everyone to this conference and to uh, give thanks to uh, uh, Mrs. Sternberg for, for hosting and for Dr. Bander for uh, helping to bring these experts together. I think it's very important that we learn some, uh, uh, we learned some hard lessons from the last several months and we've learned a lot together, both as a community and as a, and as a health system, as we've confronted just one of the most terrible challenges that we've ever faced in our um, personal or professional lives. And so this is a time to reflect. Of course, it's a time when all of us um, at, the, at the point of the new year, we think about uh, very important things about our lives and what is going to happen in the year to come. And we have so much to consider about what we have control over. And we have to listen to the latest knowledge and the latest uh, findings related to COVID. And we have to work as a team together to find the best pathway forward. Yeah, there have been just some terrible times. We lost so many people and it was so difficult not having families with, uh, with people in the hospital. And we still to this day uh, struggle with the limitations that COVID imposes upon us and, and the type of care that we, we love to provide with everyone being present. But as we confront the next phase of, of illness, as, it, as we deal with the, the fall and the winter and we have to be prepared uh, for that, we have some really great knowledge for you tonight, and I'm very proud of these Mount Sinai physicians that you'll have a chance to speak to tonight, and I hope that we can all learn from this and move together forward as a community and a, as a health system, unified in knowledge and science as we approach the best possible health care for a community that we love. Thank you. Thank you. So I just, uh, you know, while I, I want to acknowledge Rafua for, for hosting this of us, but this is really a, a community-wide uh, event. We have representatives from multiple health centers throughout the, the area in uh, upstate New York, Brooklyn, um, you know, to, to all over, and members of the of Hatsala, the Jewish Ambulance Corps. And so, you know, we were hoping when we had this last uh, Zoom town hall a few months ago, it would be our last one, and that we were done with COVID, but clearly not. And if you asked me two weeks ago, I didn't think I'd be on a Zoom call today, but, but here we are because it's important that we share this information. And we begin a, a continued dialogue uh, from the physicians to, to the community and share information. You have a lot of information in the community that we don't have access to until it comes into the hospital. And we have a lot of information that we can share. So this is really meant to be a collaborative effort. So, uh, you know, on tonight's panel, we're gonna go through a little bit of, with the experts from Mount Sinai, I'll introduce some of them in a moment. Uh, topics ranging all the way from what we've learned about the virus to testing, to immunity, to what do we do to protect our, ourselves from the virus, uh, and then talk a little bit about what treatments are available at home, uh, what can we be doing for our patients before they come to the hospital, uh, and then what treatments are available in the hospital itself. And we're going to be talking in, in a little bit of two different worlds. So we're some of us are coming from a very academic perspective. We do research studies. It's a little bit different than what we kind of see in the real world. And so uh, it, there's going to be different perspectives, and I want everyone to realize that, you know, what one person says doesn't mean everyone accepts. But I think what we present here at, on our panel are experts in science and at what we studied. And so there's a lot of information out there about COVID that's not confirmed, hearsay, or people believe. But what we're going to try to do is bring a little bit of what the evidence is for some of these treatments and what we what we know. And I think what's important to acknowledge is we don't know a lot of things yet, and we're still learning about it and research and studies are still really important. So tonight to hit on these topics, I'm gonna to kind of go through who we have on, Dr. Lou DiPaolo, who was with us last time. He's a, uh, a pulmonologist uh, over at Mount Sinai. I'm gonna skip the formal titles for the sake of time. Uh, we have Dr. Sean Liu, who is one of the infectious disease doctors at Mount Sinai, who's spearheading a lot of the uh, antibody work and trials. 
We have uh, Viviana Simon, who is one of the microbiologists and, and leading uh, virologists. Uh, we have Dr. Gopi uh, Patel, another uh, infectious disease doctor at Sinai, who's leading a lot of our antiviral work and our infection control at Mount Sinai, preventing infection. Uh, and then we have Dr. Eric Niebart, also well known in the community infectious disease doctor, who's also been on the forefront of the COVID battle lines. Um, I think that's everyone on our panel. Um, and so I'm gonna get started and I'm gonna kind of go through the topics. We'll have some time between some of the topics to go to Q&A to ask the members of the audience for questions. And just to review, the people who are in the audience live tonight are again, paramedics who head up uh, Hatsala units uh, and then leaders of the different uh, uh, community organizations. So we're amongst colleagues tonight. This is not a, a layperson call. We are amongst people who are taking care of the patients. So we really wanna leave this as, a, as, a, as an open dialogue. So I'd like to ask, start with Viviana uh, and, and maybe you can tell, walk us a little bit through how the virus has changed you know, since we started uh, you know, in, in, in the beginning of this around you know, Passover time. What's changed about the virus and how, how is it behaving? Thank you, um, um, and I welcome the opportunity to, to speak to you. So um, I'm speaking on behalf of a multidisciplinary group at Mount Sinai comprising medical doctors and basic scientists. I'm myself a physician scientist who really wants to know why, why are things happening? So we have the first case of SARS-CoV-2 in New York State was actually confirmed and identified at Mount Sinai on um, February 29th. Um, and ever since, over the past seven months, we have um, tracked the virus that caused disease in our patients. So we have now sequenced the genome of those viruses. SARS-CoV-2 is a large virus. It has like 30,000 nucleotides or letters. We have uh, developed methods to assess this. And um, we um, have sequenced um, the first 84 viruses um, very quickly within weeks to actually find out where the viruses came from. The first viruses we saw at Mount Sinai were actually from um, patients that had a travel history to the Middle East or to Europe. Um, subsequent viruses actually didn't have a clear travel history. And we sequenced, when we sequenced the viruses, the viruses really resembled viruses seen in Europe. And we found evidence based on the genome of the viruses that there were multiple independent introductions into New York City. And um, with evidence for untracked community transmission. Um, and as we um, implemented uh, measures and public health um, interventions, we were able to um, flatten the curve and really uh, over the past months have a very low level of infection rate. So we started actually contact tracing and tracking transmissions in the community. Some of the medical doctors in the community have trans um, have referred patients to us um, with the question of if there is continued shedding and we have analyzed the virus to find out whether this is the same virus compared to the initial infection or whether there might have been a new infection um, that has been acquired. Um, so sequencing really comes gives us the information whether or not there are clusters, if there is a, a continued transmission or if this is uh, a, you know, a sequela or you know, dead virus that persists over a prolonged time. Both scenarios are conceivable. Both scenarios have been described. A question I get a lot is whether the virus mutates, does it become more deadly, is it more attenuated? And the, 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 the truth is we don't really know. It's um, what is clear that initially there were two flavors of SARS-CoV-2 um, based on a mutation in spike at position 614. And the early, um, the current viruses all have this mutation. Initially in New York City, that was two third mutants, one third wild type. But as we continue to track, um, this most all of the viruses really we sequenced have this mutation. But it doesn't seem to be more and more pathogenic a virus. In cell culture, when we test the virus, it seems to be more infectious and the protein seems to be better um, expressed. Some preliminary data is very um, prom um, encouraging. It suggests that this mutant virus might also be more susceptible to neutralization. So that is, it's a very preliminary research uh, information um, 
from basic lab. To what extent that really translates then into um, reduced transmissibility or less disease, we have to wait, we have to do more research. So this is, I think at this point, I'll stop here and give it, um, I'm happy to answer further questions. Yeah, so so basically, the jury's still out whether or not these other strains are going to be more harmful or less. I think what we can still say is that this, no matter what, the patients that we're seeing now are, you know, it, it can be pretty sick and young and, and uh, you know, require lots of oxygen and even some have been intubated. So I think whether or not the virus is mutated to be less deadly, I would be very hopeful, uh, but we're still seeing that it can be uh, pretty deadly. Just for the, you know, for everyone's sake, we'll just talk about this sequencing. What will that will that matter? Will we be able to uh, new patients that are coming in? Will that will as the virus changes? Will we be able to see that that effect? Whether or not this is a, they can be reinfected. Yes. So if we have in so we can compare the if we have a sample from a person infected in March, we com can compare that virus to the virus detected now in September, and we can look at the differences. We can also compare sequences and try to identify um, clusters where one needs to um, try to intervene and try to isolate or to um, make sure that um, the spread is as uh, a chain of transmission is interrupted. So that's what sequencing gives us. Is it absolutely necessary for treating a patient? No, but it's informing us on the future steps and the next level. So, uh, Sean, can do you can you tell us about how long people should be uh, infectious for uh, once they've had the virus, they tested positive? How long do people usually continue to be infectious? We know that shedding can be eight weeks. But how long are you infectious for? So that's a very good question. Um, my understanding is it probably lasts about, I'd say, about a week or so. Viviana, can you, Viviana would be it more depends. accurate. And most, most we, people will clear the virus when, within weeks. And we think um, five to eight days after the symptoms have cleared, people are not infectious anymore. But this assumes that people have a competent immune system. I think we have now had a couple of um, uh, cases where patients were immunocompromised because of solid, um, you know, transplants, chemotherapy, and some, um, you know, um, immunodif primary immunodeficiencies. In those cases, we have observed a prolonged shedding of infectious virus. So I would want to point out. Uh, but that's rare. So, you know, this is not the majority of our cases. An important point to point out is that the people continue to have what's considered dead virus, and then they may remain PCR positive for quite some time, even though they may not be infectious. And that comes up a lot in, in a clinical setting. Okay, so Gopian, in terms of our latest policies, how long do we, we recommend when you test positive, you need to be extra cautious, obviously be quarantined, and how long do you have to be extra cautious to wear masks? Uh, well, always wearing masks, but how long are you extra cautious to, to stay in quarantine now once you test positive? So the general guideline for the general population, so not the individuals that Dr. Simon and Dr. Liu were describing, the immunocompromised individual, is 10 days from symptom onset. Or if you had an asymptomatic test, let's say you were contacted as part of a contact investigation, 10 days from that test. Um, immunocompromise is a large spectrum of patients. So there's the patients who have organ transplants, who we wipe out their immune system so that they don't reject the organ. Um, and then there's individuals who get things like steroids or other medications to suppress the immune system from attacking uh, things like lupus or thyroid disease or um, IB, uh, Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So some of those individuals can actually shed um, what Viviana would refer to as replication competent virus, so virus that can be infectious. Uh, there are certain things that we can do. We can run the test on certain machines that give us a number that gives a suggestion of how infectious the virus is at that time, but not all of the PCRs we have available can give us that number. And we use that number in the hospital to work with Dr. Simon's team to see if we need to grow the virus and she can sequence it for us if we think there is an outbreak um, or something specific to help us stem that. But 10 days is the general rule. And as you said, we do recommend universal masking um, when you're outside of your household unit. 
Well, Gopi, you would give the caveat, though, for a severe case who's persistently symptomatic, you would extend the 10-day. Absolutely. So for hospitalized patients who are in our ICU, we actually go out to 21 days um, and sometimes even longer in the hospitalized setting. Um, it is thought that some of these individuals have higher viral loads, and if we kept testing them, we would still have thresholds where uh, Dr. Simon's group could actually grow the virus so it could be infectious. It is true our tests are very sensitive and they can pick up dead virus. Um, so that's why we don't usually do repeated testing unless there's a clinical reason to do so. Let's say someone's symptoms are appearing now and they had disease back in March, we can't say that isn't a new infection. We would need the help of someone like Dr. Simon to, to look at that and figure that out. So, you know, there was a lot of talk and there was a, you know, we had a high prevalence in the community of people who were infected in the first wave of, of this virus. And, you know, and some of our antibody work in different communities in, in, in Brooklyn and uh, uh, in upstate, almost 60% of people we tested at antibodies. And there was some talk, not just in the Jewish community, but in some of the Queens communities about herd immunity. And, and uh, you know, there was some hope uh, at some point that maybe we had hit some threshold. Is that, uh, any comment on that? Is it still possible? I mean, we're seeing cases, but what, are there, has that been revised? I think a pre-existing, you know, I think even have, even if we, there is not 50% of a community that has antibodies at a given time, I think even having some will slow down the, the spread. Um, our antibody work at Mount Sinai suggests that um, antibodies to spike uh, persist for many weeks. We now see after, you know, four or five months of follow-up in some participants or patients, we see a slow decline. Um, there are other tests in the community to measure antibodies that measure antibodies to other regions of the virus, and those antibodies seem to decline faster. Um, so there is still a lot of work to understand um, which are the antibodies that provide us um, immunity. So we are very hopeful from lab experiments and from animal experiments that antibodies do provide some level of protection. But um, we, are, we, we, we are not yet entirely sure how to determine who is protected and who's not protected okay so so even if herd immunity is not a real thing having antibodies is better than not having antibodies no we definitely agree on that uh, but I think, yeah i do think what we are seeing and and dr Liu can comment more is we are seeing antibodies start to wane so in individuals that we are testing frequently since we started looking at antibodies there are certain individuals where those really high titers they may have had early on, close to when they were diagnosed or had symptoms back in March. Now in September, when we retest those individuals, we have found those, those antibodies have decreased and sometimes significantly. Um, and I think that's one of the questions that Dr. Liu is looking at with um, with some of the studies that he's been uh, lucky to be part of or, or have heard about is that we don't know the durability. Um, and it's very different with coronaviruses than it is with other respiratory viruses. Sean? Um, yeah, I'd like to comment where I think that there's a strong desire to believe in this herd immunity idea. And I, I, I trust me, I believe in herd immunity, but we can't fall back on herd immunity and depend upon herd immunity yet um, until there really is a vaccine, a, a, an effective vaccine where everyone, it's available and we can all be vaccinated. Until that time comes, we, we can't rely on natural infection to allow us to have herd immunity because our communities all have immunocompromised and susceptible peoples like young children, elderly, who may not be able to amount immune responses and it's the responsibility of the healthy adult population or whomever can receive vaccines to be vaccinated and allow for herd immunity to really occur. And that, that's, that's very important to keep in mind. So until an effective vaccine is available, it's very important to continue to practice PPE and social distancing and, and remind, remember that there's always a risk of, of COVID until it's gone. 
Yeah. So we also notice that there is a large variation between people. So one person clearing surviving COVID mounts a, a large amount of uh, produces a lot of antibodies, and someone else will produce very little antibodies, despite the fact that they had both uh, cleared the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So there is a large variation on how long it takes to mount antibodies and how many and how antibodies eventually are produced. And that might also, um, you know, predict how long uh, sufficient antibodies are uh, present. And then okay. you have different type of antibodies, different subtypes um, that might influence also how well one is protected. So this is all ongoing studies at this point. Thank you. I also want to point out that communities, we live in the New York metropolitan area and, and communities interact with each other, even though um, the, your community may be separated. Uh, it still has many interactions through just day to day, and, and many sub communities may not have such a high serology. So there is always some exposure risk. Yeah, I mean, even even within communities in, in our communities where people have it, some communities have strong, some don't. And you know, I think in the beginning, uh, some of the susceptible people were were social distancing with everybody, and now some of the younger people are not. And this is not a not our Jewish, not just a Jewish thing. It's everywhere. I mean, young people, uh, you know, are out on the streets and going to parties and spreading it. You know, in the asymptomatic carry part. So I think you know, again, the message is clear. I think to everyone that you know, you know, I I don't have any antibodies. I've been wearing masks now since the beginning. I haven't been infected. Thank God. So we have methods that work. I just wanted to kind of before we move on to something, something I asked Lou and Eric to comment a little bit about, you know, again, very important. We said some people get this infection and, you know, no, nothing happens if they have a cold and some people who are young, no pre conditions, you know, are deathly ill intubated. Lou, you, you've, you've been in touch with a lot of people in the beginning of international people. Any thoughts on what's the variability? Well, you know, we've all heard the general trends, which we know to be true. Certainly age is a risk factor. If you look at the age group, you know, that's a that's a very strong signal, right? If you're above the age of 65, you can look at the death rates, 65 to 70, 75 to 80. So certainly that's a strong risk factor. Obesity came out early to be a risk factor as well. Very clear. And then obviously other, some of the other comorbidities that go along with that, diabetes and hypertension. So, you know, you can get rough correlation, but we can all tell you, Eric, I'm sure can tell you horror stories of 20 year old patients who got sick and died from COVID-19. And I will tell you, um, you know, I ran a respiratory institute. No one who ever saw me was healthy. I saw people in the Medicare population who had multiple, and I'd get a call and they said they had COVID-19. And I said to myself, oh my God, they're gonna die. They're never gonna survive. And they survived. So certainly these trends hold up, they're true. They have, you know, uh, they've got significant odds ratios that you can predict, but within that, there's a lot of variability. So I used to tell people, this is a bad lottery and you don't want to buy a ticket, okay? Yeah, maybe if you're young and you're 21, you might win the lottery, but if you lose, it's a bad lottery. Uh, and we've all seen that. I'm sure we could all tell horror stories about all these age groups. We won't even talk about, we're talking about deaths, and hospitalizations and ventilation. You know, there's another cohort that's emerging, which is the, uh, the, the, the long-term survivors, right? And so even if they've survived the so-called long haulers, there's gonna be a lot of disability associated with even young healthy people who can't smell, complain of brain fog, have fatigue. Um, so that's another burden we're just beginning to uncover. Um, and that, I don't know if we have good an idea of, you know, what the comorbidities are that predict who's gonna become a long hauler or not. Actually, in my experience, most of the long haulers I've seen were people who actually were younger and survived, yet they became long haulers. So that's all no, how, you know, now that's, they didn't die, but there's gonna be a lot of disability, a lot of lost work um, associated with these people. Um, so the answer is it's a bad lottery, don't get it. Uh, Dr. Niebuhr. Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, look, the main things that we, we, we've all seen a lot of variability in the risk groups, but certainly the big risk groups are, are age and weight. Um, it doesn't mean if you get it in that risk group that something terrible is going to happen. It doesn't mean if you're not in that risk group that something terrible couldn't happen to you. 
But, you know, in my patients, my general patients, I mean, there's some people that I'm way more cautious with than, than, than others. I quick... think that's, you know, that's just the way you have to look at it. I mean, I think you have to know as an individual, for you, risk factors are zero or a hundred, uh, you know, if you get it. And then that's why you still need to be cautious and you, you need to maintain certain precautions. We, we hear about reinfections, Eric. Have you seen any reinfections? I've not reliably seen anybody that 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 that's had a a a, a reinfection. I, I I think there was some uh, case reported from Korea recently, but uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The rest of the people on the panel that, while a concern, doesn't seem to be at the top of the list at the moment. Yeah. And there's one in Arizona. And if you think of the millions of cases, the fact that we're talking about two or three documented cases, it can't be very high. And I think we can, you know, I agree. And I think we can speak to the people on this, you know, the community that's on the panel now is that, uh, is that, you know, there, there are, there are surrounding people who have COVID now and the ones who had COVID are not coming in. It's those who did not have COVID. I have not seen anybody yet who's had a yes. positive swab right. come back. So I think that's key. Yeah. I think it does show to at least five months later, your immunity is still there. Do we can we go back to that for a second? Because we talked about herd immunity. You know, there, there are natural histories already, right? We, we know about the seven coronaviruses that cause the common cold. There's almost no immunity that goes along with that. And then if you look at the other two uh, epidemics, MERS and SARS, okay, they seem to have a little bit of a longer uh, antibody profile, 12 to 18 months. But they're certainly not imparting lifetime immunity, even in those coronaviruses. We're hoping certainly SARS looks more like mirrors and SARS and less like the common cold coronaviruses. But let's not put our money on herd immunity uh, and antibody protection, um, so at least natural antibody protection. So what we can say now as a panel, and everyone disagrees, that right now it seems that those who were infected, at least at this moment, early, you know, in, in April, March and April, those patients are probably still protected. We can't prove it. We don't know how long it will last, but there seems to be some level of immunity right now. I, I want to emphasize that this idea of reinfection needs to be defined. Um, reinfection, if you are infected with something and you, you develop an immunity towards uh, coronavirus, it doesn't mean that you cannot get infected. It, it, it means that you have an immunity against coronavirus, meaning that if you were to be exposed with a large enough load of coronavirus, you'll still get infected. It's just that your immune system is well equipped to uh, take care of it. You, that's a great point. No, I, so I want to be very clear about that. Yeah. And I think that's the word you're saying is that you, you can still get the virus again. You may not get as sick, but is, is it exactly. possible that even if you have antibodies, you would still be having it replicated in your nose and retransmit it? It's, it's unknown. But um, you, you don't, does it not mean that you've lost the ACE2 receptor or anything like that? You still have the receptors and you still have all the cellular uh, biology to allow for the virus to replicate. It's just that you have an immune system that's ready to pounce when it sees exactly. it again. And not to get too technical about this immune system, there's this whole concept of actually, with, with having antibodies, of actually having a worse second case, right? There, there's this, at least, there's a conceptual reason that's been demonstrated in other viruses that if you have an antibody and you, get, and you do get a reinfection, you can actually get sicker. You know, we'd like to think of it being protective, and most of the times that's true, but there is this phenomenon of, you know, of hyper-responsiveness in the presence of a, or a pre-existing antibody. I don't know if it's been seen in this particular virus. It's certainly been described in other virals, in, in other oh. viruses. So the case in, uh, uh, identified in Nevada, the initial case was uh, mild, and upon reinfection, the person was hospitalized. So at this point, we have two documented cases of reinfection. In one case, it was mild and very mild, and the second case was mild and severe. So... But with an N of two, it's really, we can't yeah. conclude a lot. Um, it's even if antibody, even so it's, it's more, I think also, you, you know, you survived this terrible disease and you think you are done. So it's very, you know, it's very emotional to say, oh my God, I'm positive again. So I think that's yeah. something we, a lot of people worry. And we see a lot of uh, patients in third that, um, you know, worry that they might have been reinfected, even if it's just shedding. I think it's also important that in this time period of this 
six month period from when we first saw SARS-CoV-2 in the New York area and to now, six months is very short. Um, and throughout that time, there has been a very slow reopening. People have been wearing masks and social distancing. So those opportunities, at least in this area, were a little bit slimmer. I think we have um, a lot of cases that I refer to Dr. Simon for her to help us try to define if there's reinfection or some sort of antibody dependent enhancement, which is what Dr. DiPaolo was referring to, where the antibody is present actually help you have a more robust immune response that actually can cause more harm. So I think we still have a lot to learn, which is why we are doing this very slowly and not necessarily hanging our hat on herd immunity at this time. We have a lot more to learn. Um, and, and it is possible, you know, SARS-1 did sort of dissipate, so there wasn't a re-challenge. And MERS, because of how it's transmitted, the re-challenges are rare. This is very different because the re-challenges could be quite common, where you could get exposed again because it continues to go through um, the United States. I think what's what's really interesting, though, in talking about we're on a call with the, the community, and you know, one of the things that we're going to talk about next is that you know, the, there has been this uptick in cases. And I think there's, you know, a lot, we'll talk about how do we prevent you know, those who aren't infected. I think one thing though I want to point out for the sake of academic talk is the, the rate of masking uh, and social distancing is low. And yet a lot of people who were previously exposed currently are not infected. So I think that those, you know, I think it's just interesting from our perspective, almost a science experiment here. I mean, we have people who have antibodies or were previously exposed, previously infected, and they're not being reinfected. So I think at least from where we are. I think what's important to me is understanding is it clearly right now it's not, we're not seeing reinfections. What we don't know is that the antibodies are waning and maybe in 12 months from now, those people can get reinfected. But I think what we can say now is we're not on the ground seeing the reinfection, which is helpful because it helps us be able to deal with how do we protect those who weren't infected and how does everyone play their role. And so I want to use that to segue into this next section is, you know, Clearly the herd immunity part, even if it's there, has not stopped people from getting infected. We're seeing a large uptick of cases. And, and I think in the beginning, there was some thought, and so I asked Viviana in the beginning that oh, this, this strain of the virus wasn't as, as toxic. We weren't seeing you know, people coming in and within 12 hours uh, you know, having MIs or clots. Um, but I think that as the last two weeks have gone on, we've seen some sicker patients come in more inflamed. Uh, you know, so Eric, can you can you kind of walk us through what you see in the last two weeks in the hospital, uh, and then we can kind of go into how we can stop. Yeah, this. I, I think what 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 I've seen is we we haven't seen that acute fulminant case where the patient comes in with a massive PEs, with uh, an acute MI, and with acute renal failure. I think what we've seen now is sort of the this endothelial thromboinflammatory condition, and that's sort of manifested by this sort of subacute course of low oxygen or hypoxia is, is what we've seen in, in numerous patients right now. So the phenotype of the disease seems to be somewhat different than it was early. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I mean, we're, we're, we're not seeing that patient that comes in and within 48 hours in the hospital has, is intubated, is having a heart attack, is going on dialysis or having a stroke. What we're seeing now is the patient who's coming in, who's sort of been simmering for a couple of days, and then the first couple of days in the hospital is having this sort of subacute hypoxic course. You know, and the postulate is that it's related to their endothelial cell infection and inflammation and in, in small vessel vessel thrombosis, which is sort of you know the impetus for the. The, the steroid therapy and the use of anticoagulants. So we'll get into that, but I, I kind of wanted to see, go, go, uh, you know, Gopi and Lou, uh, how is the virus primarily transmitted now? What, do we, what have we learned since the, the first wave? <laughs> well, you know, that's, that's the changing field, right? We just, if you read the news today, aerosol is making it into the into the, you know, the, the WHO 100 scientists wrote an article about a month ago pleading for uh, the CDC to look at aerosol as a possible voter transmission. It was kind of poo-pooed. 
droplet nuclei, which is what we think about with flu and measles, you know, coughing and having these particles within, that's where the six foot rule came out because if you're not shouting and yelling and singing, these droplet nuclei drop within six feet. Um, <clears throat> but now, you know, there's emerging data that there may be some aerosol transmission. Um, you look at some super spreader events and you have to believe it was aerosol. You look at San Quentin, uh, the big uh, epidemic in San Quentin, that was most certainly probably an aerosol transmission. And there are now some increasing plane reports where people have worn masks and yet have got infected. So I think we're yet to, the, the aerosol story is gonna be emerging. I'd be interested in actually Gopi's read on that um, because it's gonna change the way we act in the hospital if we land solidly on an aerosol transmission. So a couple of things. Um, to go back to what we were speaking about, about what we saw early on, which um, individuals came in in extremis to the hospital. I think this pandemic, and we, I think we can all agree at the beginning here, at least in New York, there was a failure to be able to test. And we also asked people to not come to care. So we saw a lot of individuals come in very late and very sick. And now we have access to testing where many individuals actually had been diagnosed as outpatients and then came in when um, they became more short of breath um, and sicker, but it, that diagnosis was there and we're able to test every person who comes to the hospital, either seeking a test or being admitted for care. So I think um, testing capacity has increased quite a bit and tracing capacity, right? So people are identified and then their close contacts are also identified. In terms of modes of transmission, Looking back, we know that people can spread uh, COVID-19 through close contact, um, not wearing masks, and asymptomatic transmission probably drove this pandemic, especially as we learn more. So people are considered infectious two days prior to symptom onset, and we absolutely have seen asymptomatic transmission. In terms of these categories of droplet transmission and airborne transmission, it's a spectrum. And there, there is likely somewhere between what we think of flu and what we think of measles. And I know this community dealt with measles now over a year ago, um, that the transmission dynamics are a little bit different in terms of what they call measles in a congregate setting without an effective vaccine. For one person infected, up to 19 people would get infected. It, with COVID, um, it, it's anywhere between two or three and five, which is much more than flu. And then you have these super spreader events where lots of aerosols are generated, singing, shouting, speaking loudly, coughing, et cetera. So I do think it's on a spectrum. Um, I think what Dr. Bander talked about earlier, the fact that he has seen many, many patients and he was wearing a mask and remains antibody negative and not infected is really important. There are probably people that never had symptoms and learned they were antibody positive. So I think these transmission dynamics, it is a very, to use a dynamic sort of situation. So I, I think we're going to change, but when we look across healthcare workers that clearly were exposed by people coming in that we couldn't test um, and each other, it does look like PPE works in its current form, but I think there's more to come. And there's definitely a lot of controversy because when you look at the antibody surveillance of New York, healthcare workers were actually protected, probably because we had access to PPE and good patient placement. And most people, their infectivity or antibody surveillance data actually reflects their community. So high, we talked about this, high antibody rates in certain areas when you do large surveillance studies. So, you know, again, so, you know, we seem to have eradicated the virus at some, or at least really decreased its transmission, you know, sometime in the last, you know, before the summer, it was really gone for the most part, only a few cases there. So clearly it's must have been reintroduced. What are, I'm gonna ask everyone on the panel, like what are the most important things that we can do to slow the spread again and flatten the curve in this, knowing, knowing, and I think it's important that this community, you know, it, it's like other communities, right? We, this is a very community that's based on communal events. And I think that, you know, it's very difficult to say we're going to shut everything down uh, when it's based on that. So what are the things that within the framework we have, what can we do press on to really stop this? 
I think the data well, well, really demonstrates that when you wear a mask and wear it properly, especially outside of your household unit, and I know this is a community that embraces family and the communal setting, that really outside of your, your direct household unit, wearing a mask um, is really important. There is you know, a, a good surgical mask or even a nice three-ply or two-ply cloth mask wearing it properly, especially amongst others, um, uh, that would be really, really important. And then if you are sick, avoid other people, or if you were for at least that in potential infectious period of at least 10 days or discuss with your physician, if you're immunocompromised, it might be longer. And then those household contacts, sort of making sure that you also just in case you're asymptomatic, make sure that you're tested and that you um, try to stay within your household, at least for that period of time, that at least the 10 days or longer if you're immunocompromised. I think that's really important. That keeps your community safe, especially as people are coming back. A lot of people did leave and or are coming back for the holidays um, or coming in for the holidays. Schools are starting. I think that's really important. Eric? Yeah, I, I think, you know, th th there's always, you hear a lot of debate on how effective masks are and, and you know, I don't think we're ever going to get a definitive study, but I think you can look at healthcare workers, right? Mount Sinai, I mean, roughly the healthcare worker infection rate was like 1.2% overall. And if you take away March, it was about a half percent. And I, like you, am, am not infected. And I think the one, the, the two things that we had that were universal was you washed your hands a lot and you wore a good mask. And I think that's really the best indirect evidence is that masks and hand washing work. And I think that really sort of settles the issue for sort of universal mask wearing and, and hand washing is as to what to do and how effective it, it, it can be. I think there's other things you could do as an individual that may help protect you um, there, there's evidence now, and you know, it's been long standing that alcohol based mouthwashes have antimicrobial activity, right? They're antiviral, they're antibacterial. Uh, and there's several studies out now that show, right, the flu virus and uh, the COVID virus, right? The site of initial infection is in your posterior pharynx or the nasal pharynx, that, that using a mouthwash for 60 seconds twice a day may help reduce your incidence of getting infected, right? There's evidence that vitamin D is important to your immune response. Certainly this is a community that has generally low vitamin D levels. You can make an argument and you should check with your physician that you don't have a contraindication, right? But using daily vitamin D supplementation. So really wearing a mask, washing your hands, uh, uh, mouthwash with an alcohol-based mouthwash, uh, Vitamin D supplementation are four things people can take that would dramatically reduce uh, infection and transmission events. Yeah, and Jeffrey, you know, the messaging here, you talked about the community and we've somehow, you know, the message has gotten corrupted. The numbers were low in New York and New York began to open, right? So you can open your schools, you can open your businesses, you can open your synagogues when, it, when the numbers are less than 5%, preferably less than 1% infection rate, right? So if you really want to open your communities, if you really want the, you know, the, the, your community to go to the synagogue, to go to school, the answer is keep those numbers low. And the way you keep those numbers low is what Gopi said social distancing, wearing masks, isolating people who are sick. Um, we were on the phone with Wuhan in December with our pulmonary colleagues in, in December. And the way they broke the back of the epidemic in China was, you know, number one, they took off all the antipyretics off the market. They tested fevers for everybody. They had portable CAT scans so they could get a quick slice, detect early disease. And guess what? Those patients were plucked out of the family because commute, Family spread was the biggest way for it to break through. And the Chinese broke the back by that simple maneuver. Getting Now, in New York City, it's hard to isolate, hard to take people away from their families. But what Gopi said, isolate the sick individual. And if that family can't be isolated, take them out of the community for just a bit so that you can prove that they're tested and if they're tested negative, so you can keep those numbers low and you can keep your synagogues open, you can keep your schools open. That's how you get freedom. 
not by, you know, it's not fear. It's really keeping those numbers down. So I just have to reiterate, wear those masks, social distancing, stay away from those sick people. Um, and, and if someone is sick in the home, yeah, I guess you have to consider every family member is an asymptomatic carrier until proven otherwise. Those are the way to protect yourself and your community. But, but I guess, you know, if we look from a practical, a practical perspective, I, I agree. I think, though, if we had to pick of all the types of things that we can do, it sounds like, you know, masking, though, would probably have the biggest effect of all the different things that we talk about, you know. So each of these things are additive and, and prescribed. And I, and I agree with you. I think, though, that if we had to hit one thing of all the things that we can do, it, it sounds like we'd be masking. Does anyone else have? I, I want to quick, not gonna uh, I wanna just quickly emphasize that hand washing should be done the right way. And, and I think that that's commonly missed where people wash their hands and they put it under the water and like, oh, my hands are washed. No, 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 no. Hands need to be, take your time and wash your hands clean. If you're gonna wash, wash properly. And the second scenario I find um, is that people when they're sharing food and you're eating and you're dining with other people, that scenario is, Pretty, I think a very high risk, especially if someone is sick in your family. And I, and I know that in the Chinese community, we share food and we share dining and, and that's just a recipe for disaster, especially if there's a sick family member. Try to isolate and think about different exposure risks at home. And, I, I, and again, I think just one thing is, is that when the, exactly, what Dr. DePaul said, when the, when the infection rate was low, was I think now we're just dealing with the fact that it's there's some extra prevalence, so we need to be more more cautious. Just to touch on some other things, is now that it's out there, and I get to Sean in a minute. Uh, we talked about other strategies. You know, I, I want to talk for a minute about other vitamins, other things like zinc. You know, iron or iron What 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 does that play a role? Is that a real thing, Eric? I, I I'm sort of dubious on 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 on. You, you know those, those those other things. Uh, um, you know, I think if you're going to take a vitamin, the one to take is 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 vitamin D. Um, you know, I, I I mean, I don't know whether you want to bring it up now or not. It is a question about using hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis, but I think the overwhelming preponderance of evidence is that it does not work. And there was just another study published today. Uh, uh, on the non-peer reviewed site that showing again, it didn't work. Um, if you looked in, in uh, England National Health Service, they looked back on all patients with rheumatological diseases that were on hydroxychloroquine to see if they had a lesser incidence of COVID infections and they did not. So there's been studies of giving populations, physicians and people on the drugs for rheumatological conditions and there's no reliable evidence that using hydroxychloroquine as prophylaxis works. You know, yeah, it's a really interesting topic. I think that, you know, co you know, a lot of things have become politicized, a lot of things have become kind of hearsay, but there's a very strong voice and there are, you know, I would say at this point, contrarian physicians that are still saying that there is antiviral properties for hydroxychloroquine. And, you know, we all agree. All I, of I, think, it, I think you could say if 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 there if there is it, it's probably very minor. I think what's a generally unknown factor is hydroxychloroquine has been tried for like seven other viruses. Uh, it's been used for HIV, hepatitis C, uh, chikungunya, dengue, uh, and influenza, all of which have failed. And actually in one study, I believe for chikungunya, patients did worse. So I, 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 I think the yeah. argument is to whether it works or not really should be looking at sort of, is it really gonna be a major impact? And, and the answer is it's not. And certainly for patients that are of greater risk, older people, overweight patients, diabetics, hypertensive, underlying lung disease, immunosuppressants, it's certainly not something I would put faith into or, or, or try when there's a more rapid risk of severe disease. And there is a darker side to it, maybe overstated, but you know, it'd be one thing if it's chicken soup, it couldn't hurt, or vitamin D, it couldn't hurt, may not help. There's a darker side to Plaquenil, which is a hydroxychloroquine, in that it may actually increase mortality. Now that's an inpatient population, but one could argue they were supervised. What about in the ambulatory setting where you have prolongation of QT? So there's a dark side to Plaquenil, so it's not even neutral, I think. The, it's, the, the evidence suggests that, it, you know, it'd be one thing if it didn't work, or at least it didn't hurt. 
but it may actually it may actually hurt. So I, I think Plaquenil, um, you know, people can think what they want, but if you're going to be evidence based, the preponderance of evidence is really against it. And, um, and beyond beyond the evidence, Lou, like uh, I've been asked about this from my colleagues, uh, um, ambulatory colleagues, and then the answer I gave them was, if all the evidence suggests that it doesn't work and you're giving hydroxychloroquine and your patient dies from it, you're likely not going to, you're likely going to meet an attorney soon. Right. So I would be very cautious of when you're prescribing medications that have not been shown to work and, and just be thoughtful of that in terms of the repercussions. So what I'm going to patient, but your, your yeah. personal practice. So Sean, but the zinc story is interesting because I know in cell culture, zinc is important in terms of viral entry and replication. Um, and, but I don't know if that's ever been translated into, you know, uh, lab animals or certainly humans. It's probably good not to be zinc deficient, but whether or not supplementing has any but, role, there's no data. There. I mean, there's some evidence, there's some evidence on the common cold that, that it helped, but the more recent studies show no benefit. I think what's really important though, is, is that, you know, the, we talked about the variability of COVID and I think what affects all of us is that you know, a lot of people got COVID and a lot of people didn't get sick. And a lot of those people took hydroxychloroquine. And so there's a, there's a, uh, you know, there's an association between, you know, people who took hydroxychloroquine got better, they'll swear by it. And I think what's just interesting is that we say that us, you know, here on the panel, you know, evidence, academic people, when we look at the studies, the studies say no, but a lot of people have a gut feeling or a different feeling. And so I think that's just important that we, you know, and you, and you go online, you will find people still saying, hey, do hydroxychloroquine. But I say I agree with, with the people on the panel. I've seen no evidence. I don't see any agenda why, if it worked, people would say not. People would tell you not to take it. I mean, we all we all were looking, hoping it would work. So there's no conspiracy on my end to think that there's a reason why we shouldn't take it. I, I don't understand where it came from. But, you know, can more studies be done? Yes, but so far, no good signal. So move on from there. So, so it's not working, we say. What is working? You know, I, I want, I, I don't, it's getting to the end of the hour. I want to open up to other things and I want to get to what's working. I mean, I think that we did learn a lot in the first pandemic. We did a lot of research at Sinai. Uh, you know, I'm going to start with you, Lou, uh, and I'm going to go to Eric on, on steroids. But Lou, wh what was the most important thing from the pulmonary perspective that you think has changed uh, that we learned? Well, I think, you know, early on, you know, we used to call this a respiratory virus and it's so much more than that. It became very clear. We started calling it a vasculitis Maybe that was the wrong term, and that's not a classical vasculitis, but as Eric suggested, there's certainly endothelial inflammation and thrombosis associated with that. So I think discovering that fact and early intervention with anticoagulation really has made a big difference. Um, you know, I'm a pulmonologist, so I throw steroids around like water. Uh, a lot of anti you know, a, a, a lot of lung diseases are inflammatory in nature, and steroids have a broad um, anti-inflammatory effect. Steroids, again, not like chicken soup. They come with um, you know, some real issues in terms of infection, risk of super infection, secondary prolonged uh, you know, fungal infections, diabetes. So you know, it's been clearly shown that at least in the hospitalized patient, steroids do help in terms of you know, not winding up on a ventilator, preventing death. Uh, to me, I think, and we'll probably can have a very brisk debate about when and where you use steroids, right? The data we know that's solid is in the hospitalized patient who's got a moderate to severe disease. What happens now? Do you extend that to people with mild disease who have fever, cough, maybe have a little bit of an x-ray? Do we extend the data to them? I, I'd be very interested. I think we'd have a very brisk debate about uh, the role for steroids in that group of people. Yeah, Eric? Well, I I, I sort of look at it this way. I, I, I think there, there's little evidence that if somebody's not requiring oxygen, that the steroids help your clinical course. Um, I, I think the, the evidence that I see the most is if you're requiring three liters of nasal cannula oxygen or more, uh, generally speaking, that's the person that you're, you're, you're seeing this inflammatory cascade that's acting up and that's the person that you focus the, the, the steroids on. Um, I think you can see a variety of numbers. I think in some of the fixed dose use of steroids, you can see 25% improvement as compared to patients on versus off. I think in sort of 
some of the more weight-based uh, 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 dosage regimens. I personally think you see a, a, a little better response in improvement in oxygenation, in reduced need of transfer to an ICU and reduced uh, need for intubation and, and, and favorable mortality. So for me, the thing I sort of look at in steroids is three liters of nasal cannula uh, uh, oxygen or more is where I target the, the starting use of steroids. Uh, I'm, I'm unaware really of any significant repetitive data that shows if you're not requiring oxygen that the steroids will help. So checking- uh, I think as far as side effects go, I think the one, the biggest side effect is hyperglycemia. Uh, I think the secondary infection rate uh, again, with sort of keeping that, that, that higher dose at five to seven days and then reducing it by 50% in, in a second week and then being off, the, the secondary infection rate, surprisingly in COVID infections, has been way less than normal, particularly in ICU patients that we see. I think um, there, for the outpatient community, one thing, since we're to go back to what we were talking about, the steroid use actually may prolong the period of time of viral shedding. So that's another reason to not be so quick to give steroids unless there is this oxygen requirement. And then in the last week or so, um, there was a nice meta-analysis that took all of the trials that have been, you know, the recovery trial is the one that's been the most publicized, but took all of the trials looking specifically at the hospitalized patient and tried to look at what the sweet spot was. So it looked at methylprednisolone, weight-based and fixed dose, dexamethasone, hydrocortisone. Um, it's a really well done meta-analysis um, and it's worth taking a look at if it's something that you guys are interested in. So, um, uh, yeah. our, out, our outpatients that are positive, that are not coming in, that are on, you know, so we'll just jump to that. So who should come in? I'm gonna go back because I would just want to hit on some of the real heavy meat here now. So patients who are, host, who are at home with COVID on a requiring oxygen, should they be in the hospital? Uh, Lou? <laughs> Talk about loaded questions, right? Yeah. So certainly, you know, we all lived through early in the epidemic when nobody, they said, I'm going to die before I go to the hospital. You know, there was a lot of fear that people wouldn't get the ventilators, they wouldn't get the care they, they would get. So there was a lot of fear that people wouldn't come in. So you know what? I did things during the COVID pandemic that I would never have done in normal lives. Pe putting people on CPAP, putting people on high flow oxygen, giving people steroids at home. Um, you know, the problem with empiric treatment at home uh, is that cytokine storm where somebody can go from zero to 60 in one day. You know, they're looking okay and their oxygen is going to two liters, four liters, 15 liters, non rebreather intubated in a 24 hour period. If that person's at home, that's bad, right? And that's the, the group that Gopi was alluding to when they were coming in late. So on the one hand, I would say, yeah, we did it and we got away with it. I'm not sure I would advocate for that. I think if you have a patient who's heading in a bad direction, their oxygen requirements are going at home, you can give them steroids. That, you know, if you used Eric's rule of three liters, you know, we've had people home with five liters of oxygen. Would I give that person steroids? If they won't go to the hospital? Yeah, sure I will. If you won't go to the hospital, would I give them anticoagulation? Sure, I would. I think now we're denying them other effective therapies. We haven't talked about plasma. We haven't talked about antivirals. We haven't talked about monoclonals. Yeah. So I don't know if I'm doing my patients a service by stalling their, the inevitable, by giving them steroids, giving them anticoagulants. They're destined, if they're on that journey to badness. Right. Fear, so fear, fear, fear of the hospital, you're right, is, was, was, is what's driving it. And again, again yeah. people really don't want to be left in a room alone and a nurse comes in twice a day. I think that's kind of still ingrained in people. Uh, yeah. Are, and, I, and I look, if the person's not going to the hospital, you do what you have to. I am not sure they're well served. I think we have to make the hospital less fearful. And we have to say, you know, there are other therapies that Sean and Gopi can tell you about. I mean, this conversation came out of the fact that out of our p and committee, we're watching our remdesivir use go up, okay, our plasma use. You guys have contributed to the largest plasma co you know, collection in the country, the largest plasma experience in the country. If you don't come in, guess what? You're not getting plasma, you know, the monoclonal the data. So I'm not sure my patients will be well served if I keep them home a few extra days and I don't know if they're going to go down that bad path. So, so you vote for if they're hypoxic, come in. If you're requiring oxygen, that's your vote. 
you know, one leader, maybe not, you know, the other important thing is constant touching, right? The patients I kept home, we did telemedicine every day. I did, we had a, you know, I popped in on them. I looked at them. I saw what they were looking like, looked at their respiratory rates and kind of got a feeling like, hey, this is not going the right direction and bring them in and prevail upon them to bring them in. So if you're going to play a game of chicken, you got to know when to turn the wheel. And that's part of the problem here. When you're keeping a hypoxic patient home, there's a little bit of a game of chicken you're going on and you better keep your eye on the road and know when it's time to, to turn the wheel because right. we've Eric? seen all these people crash and burn. And we've seen that. Eric? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm sort of very cautious, you, you know? Uh, you know, I don't know if I can give a hard and fast rule, uh, but certainly people with higher risk factors for bad outcomes, I'm less likely to say, stay home. Uh, you know, I sort of a big uh, individualizer. Uh, I sort of look at more as the oxygen is more on the way home earlier when they're getting better than not coming to the hospital in the beginning. Because again, there may be the other ancillary therapies, particularly in the beginning, that may be helpful. So I look at the home oxygen as a get home earlier more than a not come to the hospital in the beginning. So, so, so Gopi and Sean, I mean, they're the ones really in the hospital that uh, are helping, you know, Sean uh, is really the one that in charge and helped with the, you know, the, a lot of the plasma that we've been using on the patients. So Sean, what is the criteria now? If you come in and you're not hypoxic, are you going to get plasma? If you come in and you're not hypoxic, then <clears throat> we have an monoclonal antibody studies that are being run in, in the hospital right now. And then the sooner you come into the hospital, the more likely you will be eligible to enroll into these studies. So it is very important that if you're hypoxic, I would recommend that you would come to the hospital. If it was my parents who are hypoxic, I, I would definitely push them into the hospital. First of all, no one at my home knows how to monitor oxygen, <laughs> oxygen levels or, or escalate oxygen appropriately. Secondly, the longer, say my father has, uh, COVID-19 and he's on hypo he's hypoxic and with uh, requiring supplemental oxygen, he's more at high risk. He's at high risk to expose my mother. <laughs> Isolating him away from my family is so important. I, I, see, I see multiple benefits for coming to the hospital sooner. Now, going back to that point that the sooner you come in, we have three trials going on for monoclonal antibodies. Two of them are ambulatory. Um, one of them is an inpatient study. Monoclonal antibodies are essentially the purified, filtered version of what you need from the plasma, boiled down into two neutralizing, very specific binds onto the receptor binding domain of the spike protein, uh, very effective in animal studies, very effective in vitro. They're pretty much like sniper rifle versions of, of convalescent plasma where convalescent plasma would be like kind of a bomb. Um, convalescent plasma, don't get me wrong. I, I have given convalescent plasma to many patients. I really appreciate the, the community's effort and, and the step that it has brought forward to help bridge the gap from having nothing to having convalescent plasma. I, my heart goes out to your community for, for pulling together so strongly and, and donating plasma. Now it's time to move on to the next generation of therapies and, and to see if there's these monoclonal antibodies that may be sustainable um, and made in a laboratory and that, that is an option and, and to see if they work. And the more people that uh, enroll into these studies, the, the faster we can come up with a, a real uh, sustainable treatment that's standardized, that is not donor dependent, that does not depend upon blood type. And we can see if they work. And that right. is so important for us yeah. to have an, a workable, effective therapy. John, I think- As virologist, I think it's really important to highlight that all those antibodies, remdesivir, antibody-rich plasma targets the virus. Yes. So they can the, only- The neutralizing the antibody targets virus. the virus. Yeah, so later on, the, 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 the sequela and the complications of COVID are mainly driven by immune responses, the, the, the cytokine storm that is out of control. But in that stage, um, cortisone and other drugs will be more helpful. 
antibodies, antibody-rich plasma, remdesivir targets a virus that is present early. So there is a window for inter targeted intervention. But if we miss the patient at that point, those, uh, those um, treatments we have will not be as effective. I just want to be clear because I think we just want to be clear because we have the Hatsala on the phone about who should come into the hospital because, you know, if you come in too early and you're not hypoxic, you're running low oxygen, you may not, you know, who, who's going to get remdesivir, who's going to get plasma, right? What are our criteria now? And so it's a Goldilocks window, right, Sean and Gopi? I mean, we, you, you, if you come in too early, you're going to wait, but we don't know how you're going to progress. We've seen people progress in, you know, 24 hours from two liters to, you know, be maxed out on a ventilator. So we don't know. So that's part of the reason why we say come in. But if you're being carefully watched, you need some level of hypoxia, Sean and Gopi, to get uh, plasma. What about remdesivir? Um, so we have been really relying on the clinical trials data uh, because remdesivir is not without harm. It does cause uh, increase in liver function tests. And it's very, we call, well, let's call it idiosyncratic. It's really not predictable. Um, we've seen individuals with no history of liver disease have their liver function tests shoot up, um, and some individuals with some underlying liver disease do just fine. So we use the NIH CDC cutoffs of, you know, Dr. DePaula referred to it as um, moderate and severe disease, and to be honest with you, it's around 94% on room air. Unless you have a history of having, you know, if you do have history of underlying lung disease and sort of live at that level, then we wouldn't want to give you something that could be potentially harmful. But if you're requiring more and more oxygen, so we want to get remdesivir to you prior to you requiring something like high flow nasal cannula or a non rebreather or a mask. So 94% cut off on room air. Yep. You know, be considered if you're sick to get remdesivir. And that's it's, important because people- It's need really to important. People are waiting. And, and as Dr. Simon said, there is a sweet spot there where you could change the trajectory of the disease based on the data we have now, including randomized clinical trials. It actually demonstrates that once someone is intubated, there's probably no uh, good outcome that is from the remdesivir alone. That's when you're really requiring the critical care expertise and the anti-inflammatories. And, and Sean, for, for plasma now and with the EUA, what, you know, I want to get back to the monocult in a second, but to get plasma now, what is, you know, what are the criteria? The criteria for plasma are very similar to the criteria for remdesivir. Okay. And, and that goes along, a lot of the times we have a committee that helps decide on whether patients should receive plasma. It's very individualized. And it really takes into account the risks associated with receiving a convalescent plasma transfusion, as well as the onset of symptoms. If a person has had a longer onset of symptoms of say 14 days or two weeks that they've been trying to hang outside um, and then finally come in, there's, there's a strong possibility that they've already developed their own antibodies against uh, COVID. So putting them at risk of receiving a convalescent plasma transfusion may be unnecessary. Right, so I think I think coming in early, but having some level of hypoxia, I think what I saw people wanna know on the phone is, when do they bring the patient in? I mean, so it sounds like we're getting at, it doesn't need to be five liters and four liters of oxygen. You could be, you know, requiring two liters and, you know, 94% of room air and you'll still be considered for treatment. Yeah, and I think one of the things to, you know, obviously if, if to bring someone into the hospital, and, and we could talk about the visitors and things like that, there, there are those issues, but we want you to know the hospital is very safe now. You know what um, we are seeing are the individuals who did delay care um, or have interrupted care, that they were so afraid of coming to the hospital, the hospitals are safe now. So we want to take care of you and we don't wanna take care of you when you're at the point where you need to be on a ventilator. We wanna take care of you early where these treatments might make a difference. In terms of remdesivir, just like convalescent plasma, it is a limited resource. So no one individual makes a decision. We wanna make sure it's <laughs> equitable distribution. So we do have individuals from different disciplines discuss the case and make sure that the, the benefit outweighs any risks because as I said, it's not without risk. Um, 
we've been lucky. We haven't used all of our remdesivir, but we do hold it as a precious resource. So we want to use it in the right patient at that sweet spot, which is before they require a ventilator or high flow nasal cannula or BiPAP or something so, like that. So just to sum up, because it's getting late, Sean and, uh, and Gopi, if you are requiring oxygen, uh, you would be a candidate to receive inpatient treatment with these drugs. I think that's, you, you would be definitely considered. Yeah, that's important. I think I want to get to one thing here, which, which Sean had mentioned, and I think is really important, especially for us as a community, is, you know, plasma right now is something that we give in the hospital. It's got uh, multiple other proteins in it and, and, and other antibodies in it. And it's just it's something that we harvested. What sh we've, Sean is working on and developed is these monoclonal <laughs> antibodies. And what's important, I think, especially early on is, is Sean has, we have two studies here at Mount Sinai. Uh, and Sean, you know, I think we should probably email out to everyone on this group how it works. With patients who test positive, correct, at home, at, at home and are not sick, just have positive, um, can get these antibodies before they get sick. So, so um, there, there is an ambulatory study where if you have symptoms consistent with COVID, you, you don't need to have tested positive. You may, it's okay if you've tested positive. You can come to our office and then we will test you and confirm that you're positive if you have symptoms. Then we can enroll you into a, um, a randomized placebo controlled trial where you may be in, given monoclonal antibodies, it's a one hour infusion of monoclonal antibodies and you'll be watched for two hours afterwards to make sure that there are no adverse, serious adverse reactions. And those, like I said, those monoclonal antibodies are highly specific neutralizing antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. And so it's pretty much everything you want out of the plasma given in a very concentrated standardized medical grade form. And you will be then followed for uh, approximately one month, and then we'll see how you do. So, so there's a two third chance, and this is what I think is important, that you're gonna get the antibody, one third chance you're gonna get saline or placebo. Uh, but it's a way to get plugged in. And if you get the placebo and you get sick, you are still a candidate for convalescent plasma. And so I think trying I wanna... to, to me, to me, Sean, and is that, you know, we, we're we looking again at that sweet spot called the Goldilocks spot where you come in early enough to get these treatments and what do we have beforehand? I think we talked a little bit about the steroids and I think, you know, Dr. Niebart and Dr. Paulo mentioned, you know, what their theories on, on who should get steroids. I think people before they, before they get hypoxic, I think the antibodies is a great thing. And I personally am pushing my patients to come in uh, and, and, and enroll in this because I really see very little harm possible harm is possible transfusion reactions are tiny because it's, it's a synthesized antibody. But I think this is a helpful window early on and also can help reduce the spread of it because it will neutralize the, 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 the virus. So, uh, you know, I'm the moderator, but in this part, I think I'm, I'm saying it's true. And I want to get to questions because we only have, you know, it's nine, it's a nine fifteen already. Anticoagulation is again, another hot area. I'm a cardiologist is one of the cardiology areas. I strongly believe that you know, people who have a positive D-dimer, no bleeding risk, um, you know, should receive some sort of anticoagulation. I think it's unclear what they should get right now. And again, also studying it, but I would recommend that if you have a positive D-dimer, you consult your, your doctor uh, and, and be started on either something like a Pixaban or even Lovenox. But I think again, controversial area, something that we're studying, but talking about the treatment area, talked about steroids, talked about blood thinners. No one on this panel seems to be in favor of hydroxychloroquine or, 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 or Eric at antibiotics, another area, before we jump to the panel. Uh, again, I, I don't think there's any credible evidence that an antibacterial is going to work for an antiviral. Okay. I, I think it's sort of that simple, right? There's really no credible evidence. And in, in fact, it looks like if you add azithromycin to hydroxychloroquine, you even increase the risk of an adverse, of doing harm, as Dr. DiPaolo mentioned. Well, let me, let me uh, open up to questions on the panel uh, to people on the, again, paramedics and the health center uh, and the local doctors. Uh, questions? I don't know who the, if the, mo the other moderators on that can, I think you can raise your hand. This is Joseph Lehman from uh, Hatala in Rockland County. 
Um, I just want something that we haven't discussed that hasn't been discussed yet with, is with regard to the upcoming flu season. Can, uh, can someone give us a little bit of, a, of guidance on what's expected during that time? Uh, Gobi, Jean? No. Sure. Um, we are starting to see some flu, uh, very sporadic in the community. I do think we are all concerned of flu and COVID co-infection, and we're working very hard to make sure we can make those diagnoses. Um, testing for both in the appropriate scenarios. Uh, like every year, we encourage everyone to get their flu vaccine. It is available. Um, and there are two vaccines that are now quadrivalent available for individuals 65 and older. Um, it is true in other parts of the world, uh, they have seen less flu. A lot, a lot of it may have to do with this particular season or with all the um, non-pharmaceutical interventions put in place with the social distancing and the masking and, and it is things like school not being in session, et cetera. So we don't know a lot about what we're going to see, but we want to avoid a what people are calling a twindemic um, at this time. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have a, other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, Tilson, one question is that I have a clinical benefit at this time to change antibodies or repeat antibodies after a particular frame in an outpatient setting. Your, your Zoom is coming in and out a little bit. If you want to chat your question, maybe. Uh, do you better now? Go ahead, try one more time. Is there any clinical benefit at this time? Check on patients and antibody in an outpatient setting. I guess the question is: uh, is, is, there, is, there, is there a purpose to antibody testing? What do we what do we do with that? Well, one thing obviously we do is we need donors for convalescent plasma because and, you know we're collecting that here at Sinai for multiple projects. So you know when people are tested, they have high antibody titers. We really need them to donate at Sinai, and we'll send out a link again. A lot of efforts from Rafua uh, going into this, but. What does that titers mean clinically, uh, Eric? I, I think there's some evidence that uh, the higher your titer, the the better it is. Um, uh, again, I, I don't think there's any hard and fast uh, uh, cutout. Sean may know the number better than me, but I think it's around 300, uh, where you see uh, uh, more of the, the benefit. Um, I think that's really about the most I can say about that. Okay. Right now. Thank you. Adam? Yes. Uh, the other question is should every non risk patient, even health symptoms, for COVID in a patient setting? I can't really hear you. We'll come back to you when you're on. Uh, Dr. Inglet? Inglet? Ooh, you're on mute. You're muted. You're muted. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. I just wonder any direction um, about how long to continue anticoagulation. Um, if we do an outpatient anticoagulation, which we are seeing high D dimers on people that are symptomatic, uh, do you wait till the D dimers come down or? Do is anywhere from four to six weeks. Is, is there any direction of how long the recommended recommend treatment is? I mean, I just, I'll throw out what I do and everyone, because I do about 30 days of, of post, post, uh, you know, post infection of, of, of you, anticoagulation, either Lovenox or Eliquis. Do you um, repeat the dimers? Do you follow no, them? So we've done it. We've done it. Some patients and we look, wait for the D dimers to go down. They go down pretty quickly. Uh, most patients, but yeah, it's a, it's a good sub marker. I don't have the data on that. Uh, anyone else do anything different? No, I, I think I pretty much agree with you. There's sort of a number between two and six, depending upon how severe you were and, and, and what problems that you, that you had. And I agree with you, the D-dimer tends to go down a little fast. I think you got to be a little careful if somebody has renal failure, the D-dimer number may be higher. Yeah, I tend to do the same thing, but there are definitely reported outliers where they're past the 30-day mark and they present with the 
flammable bowel disease. So uh, it's always nice when you get a negative D-dimer or normalized D-dimer. You know, you're playing the risk of the anticoagulation versus the risk of not. But there certainly have been cases reported out past 30 days. Um, I think that's probably the sweet spot, uh, unless they're persistently positive with the D-dimer. I mean, that's how I practice. Um, okay. Next question. We have a couple more questions, and we're going to end at 9.30. Daron? Speak up. Dr. Hi, Katz. Hi, Daron customer for thank First of all, a huge thank you to all of you for taking the time to do this. Um, any value to aspirin in, like, non-D-dimer positive patients? I've heard cardiologists doing that outpatient. Say that again, the D-dimer. Yeah, so not, not someone who's had a high D-dimer is getting put on Lovenox or Eliquis, but your average post-COVID patient, I've heard of people keeping people on aspirin for months, young patients, they're worried about these clots or MIs out of nowhere. Yeah, I think, I think you know, again, I think Viviana, you said it earlier, is that this is a, a disease of the endothelium as well. And so there's a lot we don't know. I think 30 days is what we've been doing I don't know any data on antiplatelets. Do you have anything, Lou? No, but what I, what I have done, because we do think it's an endothelial damage, we look at the postmortems, uh, you know, studies. So, and we've had people who've had persistent D-dimers, low levels, uh, and I didn't feel comfortable keeping them on, uh, on a NOAC, and I've converted them to aspirin, completely admitting it's made up. Um, you know, it's completely made up. But, you know, again, since we think it's an endothelial injury, we know it can, so it can be protracted from weeks to months after the, after the insult. So if I'm not comfortable keeping them on the uh, on a, on a anticoagulation the past 30 days, I have given them aspirin. No data to support that, but it's, you know, probably okay. But your, but your average patient, no D-dimer issue, you're not putting them on aspirin? No. No. Yeah. Uh, someone asked about if they, if you're asymptomatic, yes, you are definitely still contagious. All the rules apply that, that, that we mentioned earlier. Yep. It's the asymptomatic ones that spread the disease. I'm scrolling through to see if anyone else has a hand up. Do you have any, do you have any thoughts? Um, you know, I, and a lot of the schools, what they're doing is they're, they're putting the teachers in a mask. The kids are in a mask. They're behind like a plexiglass. The, each kid is behind uh, some sort of divider. But then if a kid turns positive, they're sending the whole class home, you know, for two weeks. Um, I mean, I know there's a kid now who has a bar mitzvah this weekend. It's, you know, the kid's in quarantine for his bar mitzvah. Do you have any, any and the kid's totally asymptomatic. Do you have any thoughts about how careful to be in these schools? You know, children are problematic, right? We, um, you know, the, we're beginning to find out there's a lot of asymptomatic children. Now they're being tested. We don't know how effective they are transmitting to adults. They're, they seem to be effective to transmit to each other. Uh, we don't understand entirely their ability to transmit to adults. Um, but they are a potential, you know, uh, you know, reservoir for infection as they, if they come back into the home. So I think the answer is you should be very careful, particularly if there's a vulnerable patient at home. Uh, definition of a close contact still applies, right? What's a close contact? 15 minutes within six feet of each other. You so, know, mask helps a little bit, but, you know, these kids are probably violating that. So in the community, a close contact, it's irrespective of the mask because we know not everyone is perfect with mask wearing. So it's any close contact. So that kid, if there's more kids at the bar mitzvah, all of those kids end up becoming close contacts. And it does look like there's been asymptomatic transmission. There was evidence in a daycare. And then in Israel, when they opened up schools, they quickly closed them back up um, because of transmission between children and even <coughs> So I think we do need to be careful. Barriers are helpful. Um, I'm the mom of a second grader who I hope will eventually go to in-person school. So I think it's great that some kids are because I think they need that. But because of things like circulation, you know, and what we talked about earlier with aerosols, things can go up and over and around. Um, so all of these things take are, are taken into play when you really want to make sure that you isolate people and keep the transmission 
um, localized and not wider in a school. Kids are hard, right? It's really, I think our kids are probably better than any other generation at washing their hands and wearing masks, but they're really tough when they get to finally be with each other. And children do get sick. I mean, you know, thankfully their mortality is significantly lower than the adult population, but they do get sick. You know, there's a systemic inflammatory disorder, which if you get it can be catastrophic. So we have to protect our children, but we also have to protect, you know, it, it's crazy, right? Because who, who's the care providers for these children when they're home? It's often the grandparents, right? Well, again, the, the most vulnerable taking care of a cohort of uh, children who may be carriers. So it's a, it's a problem. It goes back to the original Chinese experiment of isolating, you know, it's really community family spread. And if these kids come home, they're gonna be, they're gonna be exposing the most vulnerable their grandparents. Well, listen, I think it's 930. It's late. And I really appreciate the panel being on for an hour and a half. I think it's a, a pretty long time. I think I spoke with, uh, you know, some of the organizations, it will be great. You have other, you know, people on a panel in the future, you know, as more questions come up, as we learn more, uh, update back everyone on what's happening in the hospital uh, next week or the week after to continue this conversation. And I think it's good to have this, you know, back and forth, especially between Hatsala and us as to who should come in and what treatments are available, what we should be doing. So thank you everyone for participating. I really, really appreciate it.